All right, so it's a pleasure to be here today and a very interesting group, Citrus. Uh, I'm sorry that I haven't had a chance to interact with them more, although I have talked from Ben from time to time. So um, I hope this leads to some collaborations, not only with them, but other people uh, in the audience. So I'll give a little bit of a technical overview about our program, the Center for Biophotonics. Uh, we're located very nearby here. We have our main headquarters uh, on 2nd and Stockton Street, right across from the Med Center, actually the People's uh, the Cancer Survivors Park. And we also have some space, of course, on campus. I also wanted to point out to you something I was just told moments ago that today happens to be the day that the first laser was uh, demonstrated by Theodore Maiman in uh, 1962. And I don't know if you can decipher this, but of course the, the source of all knowledge now is Google. So this came right off of uh, Google. So if you go to Google at this moment, you'll see, in fact, that uh, they're parading that today's big celebration is that of the laser. And it fits right into the purpose of our center, which is the application of photons to biosciences and medicine. So what is biophotonics? It's um, about imaging tools, for example. We have all sorts, uh, imaging live animals, uh, developing probes so that we can image and, and attach to specific uh, analytes of interest or cellular components of interest. It's actually about r uh, live three-dimensional imaging of, in this particular case, and I'll show you a little bit more about this later, um, viral infection of one cell uh, from another already infected cell. Sensors and assays, of course, are very important. Everything from the pulse oximeter to developing massive arrays for uh, discovering drugs, of course, all coded by the colors that we use for fluorescence and developing of nanosensors that can actually be pushed around inside of a cell. And we do this, in fact, as do many others, where we can measure local pH value local glucose value and so forth inside of a living cell from looking at the optical signatures that are modified by the local uh, chemistry. And certainly in clinical diagnostics and therapy, uh, everything from developing lasers, this is my co-director of the center, Jim Bogan, Dr. Bogan here is a neurosurgeon. Uh, we're trying to develop better surgical systems for him that can be extremely precise using ultra short pulse lasers and guided by fluorescence and other technologies. This is a very dim drawing, but it's showing photodynamic therapy, which again can be used to treat, uh, and is actually FDA approved in many cases to treat cancer. And now we're thinking about applying this as a non-antibiotic solution to the treatment of nosocomial infections and other types of infections. So again, using light to kill specified tissue. This is an example of some imaging of at uh, hyper, what we call hyperspectral imaging. So we're looking at normal tissue, very high resolution, at the micron level and abnormal tissue and we combine this with ultra precise surgery to make it such that you can actually do surgery at the cellular level of precision. So biophotonics is a, is a very big marketplace today. I just want to call your attention to this because the non-medical applications aren't very big probably because of the word biophotonics but uh, <laughs> the, the medical therapeutics is about 8.2 billion a year worldwide and medical diagnostics, of course, is around 37 uh, billion. So, and many of these market sectors are growing somewhere between 10 and 30 uh, percent. So it's a, it's a good wagon to, to hitch on to. Okay. Please. <laughs> it's going to all of a sudden jump about three view graphs. Or maybe not. <clears throat> I think this happens to be a view graph that has, it's about probably 30 megabytes itself, the next one. And um, it's totally frozen up my computer at the moment. I haven't had this particular event happen. There we go. It's not a big view graph, so I don't know what I did wrong. Um, anyway, a little bit about our center. Um, we are centered here, or headquartered here at UC Davis. We're also, however, partnered with some other very recognizable uh, local and uh, somewhat more distant uh, institutions. 
And in fact, our work is all about, it's all interdisciplinary and it's all about putting together the disciplines of bioscience, engineering, physical science, and clinical and research medicine. Um, we do quite a few different things um, in science and technology. They're shown here. A lot of them are imaging. I'll show you more about this in just a few moments. A lot of them also are about extremely high resolution imaging at the true molecular scale, but also developing new assays uh, for, for example, prostate cancer, also doing, developing new means of, of cell sorting, in our case, using something that's not based on fluorescence, Raman scattering. We also have a huge education program, goes all the way through kindig from kindergarten all the way up through uh, visiting scholars, uh, but a real concentration on high school students to try to generate the next or create the next generation of students. We have quite a few industry sponsors and we do a lot of different uh, uh, knowledge transfer activities and we also create a lot of journals that we work with and we also have host a lot of conferences. So look on our website if you want to learn more about that. Our main headquarters is located right across the street over here at 2nd and Stockton. We occupy most of the bottom floor of that building in addition to all of our other locations. And we have quite a few people associated with us around a Every year when we have a retreat at Lake Tahoe, we get about 120 to 130 people. And when I have my usual seminars, I get about 10. So there must be something about where I hold, hold these uh, retreats that makes a difference. We also have developed a, a web portal for our field uh, worldwide. It's called biophotonicsworld.org. You can go there and have a look at what we're putting on there. But basically, it's to open our community to others and give it a place to interact. As I mentioned, our uh, mission is to develop, uh, adapt, and apply photon-based technologies to solve major challenges in the life sciences and medicine. We have about 90 or so PhDs and MD research participants at any one time, 16 postdocs. We've brought through right now about 247 undergrad and graduate students. That means they've had an experience with us of greater than eight hours. Typically, at any one time, we have about 15 graduate students who work with us full time. And we always, our steady state is about 30 projects in three different theme areas. Our strategy is to have a lot of center-driven projects which are based on the skills, uh, mostly physical science and engineering skills of the people um, in our center. We then reach out uh, what we call end user defined collaborations to work with people in medicine and in some other fields. Uh, this provides us an engine, if you like, using NSF funds to to keep this core together, constantly innovating it, and then reaching out, building collaborators with some seed funds, and then going after new funding, uh, be it from industry or from federal agencies. Our science and technology portfolio for this year is uh, pretty big. Uh, everything from ultra-resolution optical microscopy shown here, where we have something like five times the diffraction limit of light and resolution. So we can use 5,000 angstrom light or 500 nanometer light to get 50 nanometer resolution. We have a brand new microscope that, that accomplishes about um, 100 nanometer resolution right now, right across the street. And it's commercially available now from Applied Precision Incorporated. We also do a lot of other types of imaging, uh, cars and other label feed microscopies, which enable us to look at, in this case, sperm cells, uh, living sperm cells and looking at the preponderance of DNA in, uh, in protein in the, in the head of the sperm cell as compared to the tail. We also do, as I mentioned, molecular scale resolution and so forth. We develop probes based upon plant life. This comes from Professor Ligarius at campus. We develop microsensors and nanosensors I mentioned, and we study HIV and so forth. And we develop a lot of different medical devices. Uh, I probably I'm in the heart uh, or cardiovascular section here. Uh, we have a couple of projects. Maybe I was just slipped here for convenience, but uh, uh, certainly one of them is working with Biosense Webster to develop a, an optical probe to um, help survey how much damage we're doing with RF ablation when we're treating heart arrhythmias. We also focus primarily in many of our projects on imaging and detection, always on live organisms to the extent possible. Everything from uh, you know the whole organism itself in this particular case, um, all the way down to single molecules using X-ray diffraction microscopy. Um, speaking of that particular project, we have two different versions of it: a flash X-ray diffraction imaging project, which allows us to use eight kilovolt X-rays to actually image single biomolecules which are being dropped by serially. This is to avoid having to crystallize them. In many cases, they can't be crystallized. So this opens the door for a whole, t whole different way of doing protein 
uh, crystallography. This experiment is about to come on board um, in 2008 when they opened the doors at uh, what the laser coherent light source, or the LINAC coherent light source at Stanford, and we shall be doing some experiments there within the next uh, two years to demonstrate this technique, which will give you about point, um, point 0.1 nanometer, less than point 0.1, point 0.01 nanometer resolution ultimately. We also have a means of doing this with serial diffraction using conventional uh, Linux and uh, co other types of coherent sources. The difference here is we're using femtosecond duration X-ray pulses here from a very coherent source. In this case, we can use standard uh, light sources from a Linux, and we orient each one of these particles before they come into the beam. Um, this is some further literature you can look at, um, but the computational need here for people who are interested in, in this is to reconstruct real images from uh, about 10,000 diffractograms that we create in taking one of these images. It's really a tour de force. This is an example of it. Again, you come in with about a 10 femtosecond pulse. Just after the pulse, you still have a, a collection of, of uh, atoms together here in this molecule, and then we've ionized them so they ra very rapidly decompress. But you get a very noisy diffraction pattern. Like I say, you have to combine about 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7th of them into a data set, recombine them, reconstruct them, and render them into an image that we can understand. This is an early example of, on a real object. This is Austriococcus. This is a translation uh, electron microscope image of one. Uh, this is taken at much lower energies than we ultimately will have at the Linac coherent light source, uh, but it shows you the diffractogram and the reconstructed X-ray image here of what was at one time a living Austriococcus, and at this point um, has pretty good correlation with, of course, the translation. Um, transmission electron microscope image. I also mentioned that we have uh, a new structural illumination microscope across the street that has been um, pioneered by our center but now is, is available commercially. We have the very first uh, prototype of it um, manufactured by Applied Precision Incorporated. It, it gives you wide field imaging. Uh, the way it works really is this concept of um, you, it's really difficult to explain without this movie working and it's here we go, maybe it will work. Uh, what happens is it's basically you take an unknown pattern, which is your object, you take a known pattern, which is a structured illumination source, and you take many different images with them. And like you see here with the moiré concept, you can render and get other information that you couldn't see otherwise just by looking at interference fringes. What we're doing is basically collecting a lot more information. It's like interference microscopy, a lot more information than you could get normally. Again, the computational need here is to reconstruct very high resolution image from, uh, from the individual Moiré uh, images. Uh, these are some prototype images we've taken. Um, again, in this case, looking at actin fibers with normal microscopes, uh, with our microscope, looking at something here with 50 nanometer fluorescent beads, which cannot be seen with sort of your best conventional microscopes and can be very clearly seen here. Now, this is fluorescence microscopy. Here's a green fluorescent protein labeled hippocampal neuron too, just to show that we can actually see something biologically interesting. Of course, all of you are probably familiar with 3D um, sectioning using confocal microscopy, the idea being that you can adjust um, an aperture to define which point you want to image um, or longitudinally inside of an object, and you can do so actually pretty rapidly. We've put this to work for us. Um, but there's quite a few computational needs still there, 3D rendering, segmentation, and display among them. Here's an example of it applied to um, HIV transfer from uh, two different T cells, one that's been infected to one that's not been infected. So the idea here was we, uh, a collaborator of ours, Ben Chen, at, C at uh, Mount Sinai University, has been successful at uh, putting a green fluorescent protein inside um, a actual gag protein, which is associated with uh, trans uh, or with viral or, or cellular cell to cell viral infections, and uh, so what you're seeing here is an infected Jurkot cell coming into contact with other cells that were not infected initially. But what you're seeing in this particular case is the transfer of this little green fluorescent protein labeled gag protein into the new cell, and it's taking place. Um, exclusively at this so-called viral synapse, or the place where the two cells come into, into contact. Here's a different example of it, but you can again see the synapse region. This is a fully infected cell, so it's got a lot of fluorescence. And what you're looking at here now is, is the uh, target cell, which is becoming infected. 
And why this is significant is that previously it was thought these cells explode and then the, these proteins sort of float around in your uh, intracellular fluid or wherever they happen to be uh, located and then reinfect the cell through the surface. And uh, what appears to be happening, at least in this particular case, is that there's a very strong uh, migration from one cell to the other or transfection from one cell to the other at the synapse point, which of course opens the door for developing a vaccine uh, that shuts down this particular mechanism. We're also developing laser-trapped uh, Raman spectroscopy for a means, as a means to chemically analyze cells and, and cellular components. The idea here, if you've never heard of it, and I seem to have my little arrow everywhere except where I want it, um, is that you shine light on a bead. This has been around a long time, but light actually can impart enough force to, s to capture that bead in a certain area, and it can be used to hold it there, and then you can move a, a microscope stage or whatever uh, to, to take it to different places. So computational needs here are really for data analysis, multivariate analysis, uh, discriminant analysis, and non-conventional approaches. I'll just show you an example here. This is where we're trying to develop a new way of doing um, flow cytometry. So we can actually grab cells and analyze their spectrum, their so-called Raman spectrum, and from the different spectrum we can uniquely identify them. This is, for example, showing the difference between normal cells T and B cells and abnormal cells. And we've done this with a lot of other different uh, things, including embryonic stem cells. Uh, again, this is non-fluorescence based. You can uh, actually see us capture cells here and move them over. So this is how you would do it. You would grab a cell, move it over. This is a microfluidic device. This is working with Luke Lee at Berkeley um, to actually provide a means to separate cells that we identify from their um, fundamental Raman spectrum. So some future directions in, in this field are really uh, in advanced microscopic imaging, sensors, assays, and probes, in particular the point of care testing or, or technology devices, the optofluidic uh, labs on a chip, and I know some of you, are, you people are working on those. I'm looking forward to it, uh, to seeing more about it, and these point of care testing devices, uh, real-time pharmacokinetics, even biobosimeters. Uh, just finish up with, with we're now a part of a new uh, which came out of our center, and the PI is uh, Jerry Cost here, who's in the Department of Pathology, a new rapid uh, multipathogen detection point of care technology center uh, for national disaster readiness. We develop a lot of technologies for this that are based upon biophotonics, but there's a, since it's all done in the field, there's a lot of need for transmission of data, analysis of the data in the field. So see me afterwards. I'm out of time here. <laughs> Thank you.